Alex Bowman shuts down the rumors about him being fired from Hendrick Motorsports at the end of this season, and RFK Racing is expected to expand to a three-car operation in 2025. What's going on, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to our video. We got some NASCAR and other motorsports stories discussed here today on the channel. Let's go ahead and just show them straight those really quickly. We're first going to take a look at a couple paint schemes that have been revealed over the course of the last couple days. Let's go ahead and just show them straight into them. The first paint scheme we're taking a look at is John Hunter Nemechek's 2024 Olipop scheme that we'll see this weekend at Atlanta. I think the scheme's okay in my opinion. I think Legacy's had some pretty good looking paint schemes. This one's okay. Hopefully John Hunter Nemechek though could have a good run this weekend at Atlanta. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is J.J. Yelly's 2024 U.S. Aviation Scheme that we'll see this weekend at Atlanta. Scheme's okay, in my opinion. I do like the blue. I do like the orange. I think it's okay for sure. Hopefully, J.J. could have a good run this weekend at Atlanta. And the final paint scheme we're taking a look at is Connor Zilich's 2024 KOA Campground Scheme that we'll see at Kansas Speedway in a couple weeks. This scheme looks really great in my opinion. I think Junior Motorsports knocked this one out of the park. It'll be one of the few select starts he'll of course have in the Xfinity Series later this year. This looks pretty good. Definitely looking for a CS car out on the racetrack later this year at Kansas. And now we're going to go ahead jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the CW. As it was announced Wednesday early morning that the CW will be sponsoring Joe Gibbs Racing for select races in 2024. They, of course, are going to sponsor Sheldon Creed this weekend for the NASCAR Xfinity Race at Atlanta Motor Speedway. And they'll also sponsor Ty Gibbs next weekend in the Cup Series Race at Watkins Glen. Obviously, it was announced that the CW, of course, will have full broadcasting of the Xfinity Series starting at Bristol in a couple weeks least, which I think they're trying to advertise. We've been seeing some advertising, of course, for the Xfinity Series headed over to CW, and I think having a car on the racetrack to know that the Xfinity Series will be headed to CW, I think will be able to attract a lot of people to go check it out, and I think, especially since it's going to be on broadcast, I think a lot of people will be able to check that out. These cars look great, in my opinion. It's kind of like a throwback to Daniel Hemmer's car he had in 2021. I think it looked pretty solid, and I'm glad to see that the CW will be sponsoring JGR for a few races this year. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Atlanta purse money for this weekend. So every time we have a NASCAR Cup, Xfinity Series, or Truck Series race, Bob Pockers puts out the purse money for that event. Bob reports that for the Cup race, it's $7,800,384, and for the Xfinity race, it's $1,480,058. I think that's some good purse money, at least for the Cup Series, for sure, nearly $8 million. Obviously, with the charter money, which we're going to talk about the charter agreement in just a little bit, charter teams do end up getting a ton of the money. Xfinity, that's some pretty good money. It is an Xfinity Super Speed Race. There are 37 cars entered. There, of course, may be a 38 car that could enter in the future, but I think it is for sure, nonetheless, some pretty good purse money for this weekend at Atlanta Motor Speedway. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Levi Jones. As it was announced earlier this evening that Levi Jones has officially become the new GM at Aldora Speedway. Levi Jones, for those who don't know, was a former USAC driver, I believe, and also was working as one of the higher-ups in Indy NXT and helping Indy NXT grow. This is a big pickup for Eldora Speedway, but it's a major loss for the Indy NXT series as that series was continuing to grow and bring a lot of cars in as well. But at the same token, at the same time, this is very exciting for Adel Adora Speedway as well. With the future, there was a lot of rumors about Tony Stewart selling it at one point, and even though that is not happening at the moment, I think it's really good to see they have a new GM coming in. Hopefully, Levi Jones can do a really solid job with Eldora Speedway going forward into the future. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Carl Edwards and Ricky Rudd. As it was announced earlier this morning that Carl Edwards and Ricky Rudd will be given the command for the NASCAR Cup Series race at the Charlotte Roble in October. Both of them, of course, will be inducted in the NASCAR Hall of Fame next year, which is why they're both giving the command. It's really exciting to see that not only Carl Edwards is coming back at the racetrack a lot more frequently, but also Ricky Rudd is coming back to the track as well. We've been seeing Ricky Rudd a lot more active since, of course, he got inducted. And then, of course, it's been great to see Carl Edwards back in the track. He's probably going to get asked at some point, are you ever going to come back behind the wheel? Which he did say back in May, he's probably not coming back to get behind the wheel of a cup car. I'd love to see him come back, but he's probably not coming back. But it's nonetheless really awesome and exciting to see that both of the legends will be given the command for the Bank of America Robo 400 later this year. 
And now we're going ahead, jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Mason Maggio. As it was announced last night that Mason Maggio will drive the 35 for Joey Gase Motorsports this weekend at Atlanta Motor Speedway. Mason Maggio has made select truck series starts throughout the year. He's driven for the Rayoon Brothers and also driven for Viridian Motorsports. And I believe also has made select Xfinity series starts for teams like NBM this season as well. This will, I believe, be his first start with Joey Gates Motorsports this year. This 35 car course won't have to worry about making the field because there's only 37 cars that are entered this weekend. I hope Mason can do really good. I think Mason does have a lot of talent. He does have a lot of potential. He's very, very young. And I think Mason could have a solid run. We'll see what he can do. Maybe he'll somehow shockingly get a top 20 or a top 25 with Joey Gates Motorsports this weekend at Atlanta Motor Speedway. And now we're going ahead to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Davis Starr. As it was announced earlier today that Davis Starr will be driving the 14 for SS Greenlight Racing this weekend at Atlanta Motor Speedway. Davis Starr has made select starts in the NASCAR Xfinity Series here for teams like MBM Motorsports, has driven in the Cup cars well for MBM, and I believe has made select starts so far this year as well for SS Greenlight Racing. I'm not expecting Davis to set the world on fire. He had a lot of tests in the Truck Series back in the day, but I'm not really expecting Davis Starr to set the world on fire this week, and I think he's probably going to struggle, unfortunately. It would be cool to see him have a good run, but like I said, I'm not really expecting much. I think he unfortunately will end up struggling in a pretty big way. If he's going to survive the big card and Rex, so maybe he'll prove me wrong, and we'll see what he can do for sure this weekend because it'd be cool to see him have a strong run for sure this weekend at Atlanta Motor Speedway. And now we're going ahead to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Elon Day. As it was announced earlier this morning that Elon Day will drive the 45 for Alpha Prime Racing once again next weekend at Watkins Glen in the Xfinity Series. Elon Day made his long way to return to the NASCAR Xfinity Series for the first time since 2016 when, of course, he drove the 45 car at the Chicago Street Course. Unfortunately, he did end up crashing during the practice session. Unfortunately, he had to pretty much withdraw from that point, and they were not able to qualify. Hopefully this time around with Elon's experience, because I do think Elon is a talented race car driver, hopefully things do go a lot better this time around, because I think Elon's a lot better driver than what he showed there. That was a pretty bad move. The spotter didn't do a great job in that location, and Elon really wrecked after 30 seconds. So I really hope he does a better job this time around and doesn't end up getting in a wreck this time around and can make the show, because I think if Elon makes the show, he could have a good run. They've had some good runs over Alpha Prime this year, so we'll see what Elon can do next weekend at Watkins Glen. And now we're going ahead to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Wayne Taylor Racing. As it was officially confirmed after weeks of speculation that Wayne Taylor Racing and Andretti Autosport in IMSA will officially be returning to Cadillac in 2025. There will be a two-car operation once again in 2025 with the number 10 Kanoka Minolta team and, of course, the number 40 car, which has had a bunch of the Andretti Autosport drivers get involved in as well. There's also continued speculation about Andretti potentially going back to Cadillac or going to Chevy potentially in the future but as of right now they're expected to say with Honda for 2025. There's been a lot of rumors about this, obviously. Chip Ganassi Racing, we know they're switching over to Acura for next year. So basically, you have a swap. You've got Ganassi going to Acura, and of course, you got Wayne Taylor going over to Cadillac next year. We've been seeing a lot of growth from Cadillac in recent years, and I do think that Wayne Taylor Racing at Cadillac it is going to have a lot of long-term and long-awaited success. I think it's going to be pretty exciting to see what they can do for sure. It's very, it's just exciting overall to see Wayne Taylor Racing back in Cadillac. I remember 2017 at the Rolex when Jeff Gordon went on to win when, of course, he ran the Rolex in 2017. And they had a success with other drivers like Fernando Alonso a few years ago. And then, of course, the success they've had with other drivers in the past, like a Kamui Kobayashi. So I'm really excited to see this for sure. And really great to see that Wayne Taylor Racing will, in fact, be returning to Cadillac in 2025. And now we're going ahead to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about DGM Racing at Watkins Glen. As it was announced yesterday afternoon that there's going to be a driver swap for both these cars. So Josh Blicky, who usually drives another the number 92 or the 36 car for DGM, he's actually going to be driving the number 91 car for DGM Racing at Watkins Glen. While Kyle Weatherman, who usually drives the 91 car, he's going to be switching over to 36 car for one weekend next week at Watkins Glen. 
I think both are really good drivers. Obviously, Josh Blakey is a really good road course racer. We've seen what he's been able to do. I know he didn't get to finish at Portland with Joe Gibbs Racing, but I think he did a really good job over there before the crash. And then, obviously, Kyle Weatherman, he's a very underrated driver and just has had a lot of bad luck so far in 2024. I think both drivers are going to do a really solid job, all things considered, and I do think they are going to be pretty competitive, considering DGM's road course program has generally been pretty good. So we'll see what ends up happening, and we'll see if both DGM cars can run well. I believe the 36 car will probably be struggling to get in on owner's points, so we'll see if both cars can be able to make the show at Watkins Glen next weekend. And now we're going to head to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Chip Ganassi Racing. As it was confirmed by Marshall Priff from Racer.com that Chip Ganassi Racing will in fact be downsizing their IndyCar program from five cars to three cars in 2025. We'll get to the drivers who are expected to drive in just a second, but this has been rumored over the course of the last couple weeks and people like David Land and Tony Donahue that they were expected to downsize. We already know the Meyer Shank Racing will have a technical partnership with that organization next year. Obviously, a big reason why they're downsizing from five to three cars is not because they really want to get rid of their driving talent. It's because of the fact that that charter agreement is expected to be enacted in IndyCar in the future, and one of the big things coming in the IndyCar charter agreement is that they're only going to allow three full-time organizations and there could be some open cars but they're only going to allow three cars per team that want to get paid by the organization so that's why they're doing this in my honest opinion when you think about chip ganassi racing it has been a really solid team in indycar now who are expected to be the drivers the drivers that are expected to be behind the wheel are obviously scott dixon alex Plo. And it sounds like Kiffin Simpson is going to be the other driver behind the wheel of this car, meaning that Marcus Armstrong and Linus Lundquist will likely not be with this team next year. Now, Linus Lundquist is rumored to be going potentially to Meyer Shank Racing to drive a 6'6 car. It was reported by Marshall earlier today that Meyer Shank Racing is very close to announcing who that driver to 6'6 will be. We've heard Marcus could be going to Prema next year. That's rumor that I've heard, so that could be a potential possibility. It sucks that this has to happen because I think Chip Ganassi Racing's had a lot of success but sometimes you have to make sacrifices for things to happen. It's unfortunate this happened. It's kind of a tragedy in all honesty for the team, but it really isn't a big shock and surprise considering all the rumors that have been going around. Chip Ganassi Racing, like I said, will downsize to a three-car organization in 2025 for next season. And now we're going to head to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about NASCAR Studios. As it was officially confirmed yesterday that NASCAR Studios has officially announced three new shows that have already begun. There's going to be NASCAR Daily, which is going to be taking place on YouTube with Shannon Spake from Monday through Friday on YouTube. I believe it's going to be happening around 4 or 5 p.m. Eastern. It's going to be kind of like Race Hub every single day. There's also going to be another show called Drop the Jack that's also going to be on NASCAR's YouTube channel as well. It's going to feature multiple picker members like Daryl Edwards and Mamba Smith also will be part of that show. But the big show we kind of already talked about this week is that there is going to be a new show called NASCAR Inside the Playoffs. Mamba Smith, Jordan Bianchi was not featured in this episode, but he'll be featured in other episodes throughout. Shannon Spake and Steve Vitar are on this show. And for the first few episodes, including earlier tonight, you had Kyle Busch as the driver analyst that was on the show. I think the first episode I really, really enjoyed. And it, this, is, of course, is the first True TV and TNT show that NASCAR is doing. And we've already seen a lot of activation. We've, of course, got the Bleacher Racing account that's come out very recently because NASCAR, of course, will be going over to TNT and True TV, which Bleacher Report is owned by HBO and the Warner Brothers Group over there as well. I think this is really huge for NASCAR, all things considered. The fact they continue to expand the prevalence and they're looking to get new shows. It's good to see that Shannon Spake has a new show that she can host in all honesty. I think Shannon was one of the best parts that Fox had for many, many years. And she kind of kept Race Hub together for as long as she was there from 2017 when she joined that program up until the time that unfortunately she left at the end of this year. And obviously they've been negotiating and trying to find out where she was going to be. So I'm glad to see that she has somewhere to go. I'm also glad to see Latart. There's been rumors about him going potentially to TNT and Amazon. So I'm glad to see all these people have shows in place to go for next year. I just think it's honestly exciting. And I think the show is really good as well. I enjoyed the first episode. And it's great to see that all these people have found a place to go. At least to do a show. Be, they, the, the media show that they're doing, of course, will be every not every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, around the time Thursday night football is going to be taking place. 
And now we're going ahead, jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Michael Jordan. As Motorsports.com Twitter page put out a very interesting tweet talking about Michael Jordan. He basically said that NASCAR can replace basketball. Now, obviously, Michael Jordan is a co-owner of 2311 Racing. And obviously, when I saw that tweet, a lot of people really kind of took that out of context. What I think he's kind of saying is that basically NASCAR right now can't replace basketball on what his big priorities are at the moment. Michael Jordan is very invested in 2311 racing. He's been at the racetrack a lot more frequently. In fact, he was at the racetrack at Darlington. He was there to see Tyler Reddick, of course, win the regular season championship, considering he was not feeling well throughout the whole entire race. And he also saw, unfortunately, Bubble Walls not make the playoffs, but he's been at multiple races where Bubble Walls has had a lot of success. Having a team owner there who's not just there to basically pay a check or whatever, but to be at the track and support their drivers, it really shows that he cares and is invested in the sport. And Michael Jordan has been in a lot of NASCAR races before. He's shown up to a lot of tracks. He, of course, was, has been good friends with Denny Hamlin for many, many years. And it's good to see that he's getting motivation. He's very involved. He's very invested. He cares about what's going on. And having someone like Michael Jordan who's involved in a sport in a major way and involved with the drivers that are going for him, that is really, really huge. People like Tyler Reddick and a Kurt Busch, for example, and those people at 2311 and potentially Riley Harris, if they do get a third charter next year in Bubba Walls, can all go to Michael Jordan and basically ask for advice. And that's a really, really good thing. Having Michael in the corner for the team is really, really huge. I think he's been a big role, why, big reason why Tyler Reddick has had a lot of success. So this is really great in my opinion, and it's pretty exciting to see that Michael Jordan is so invested in the sport and is showing the support to the drivers that currently drive there, and it's good to see that he is invested in racing, in my honest opinion. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Ryan Blaney. As Ryan Blaney was speaking to media during playoff media day, and he basically confirmed that he feels fine and is ready to race at Atlanta Motor Speedway. Now, for those who did not watch the Southern 500 on Sunday, which most of you watched the channel probably did, Ryan Blaney almost got injured during the Southern 500. On lap three of the race, Martrix Jr. unfortunately crashed, trying to pass William Byron, believe, for fourth or fifth position. He was trying to move to the field. He made a major mistake, got loose under William Byron, overcorrected, went up the racetrack, and unfortunately hit Ryan Blaney really hard into the outside wall. And he said, I think, that his wrist was feeling very sore. Now, Ryan Blaney then spoke to media members, including, I believe, Cal multiple people from the NBC group, after the race had concluding said he felt fine. It's good to see that Ryan Blaney is good to go to race this weekend. Ryan Blaney is a driver, in my opinion, who could easily win the championship. But a reason I think a lot of us were concerned is, remember, Kyle Busch a few weeks ago said he kind of fractured his wrist. And had they raced the next weekend after the break over 100, Kyle Busch said he was probably going to need a relief driver. Luckily, we had the two-week break, so Kyle Busch could have a couple weeks to sit down and rest that arm. And luckily, it seems like Kyle Busch is good to go. He doesn't really have any wrapping on his arm anymore, which is really good to see. And it seems like his arm is feeling, and hand is feeling a lot better. Again, Ryan Blaney, someone who's been involved in a lot of big wrecks in recent years. He obviously had that big wreck in Nashville last year, where they basically put some new tire barriers down there. And then, of course, he had that big wreck at Daytona in 2023 as well. Ryan Blaney is a very tough driver, in my opinion, and it's great to see that he is going to be once again racing this weekend. I think he easily could win this weekend at Atlanta Motor Speedway, and had he gotten injured, that would have been really unfortunate, and that definitely would have really, really sucked. So I'm glad to see that Ryan Blaney's all good and is okay, and again, it's good to see that Ryan Blaney will be back behind the wheel this weekend. I don't know who they would have gotten to replace him had he needed to be substituted or he just run a few laps, but I'm glad to see that everything is sorted out and has gotten straightened out, and it's great to see that Ryan Blaney is all all clear he's all good to go and is ready to get behind the wheel and try to race for a championship and get his second straight championship last time someone went back to back of course was jimmy johnson so we'll see what he can do and we'll see if ryan blaney can run well but good to see that he's good to go to race this weekend at atlanta motor speedway and now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Dale Jr. Now, of course, a couple days ago, there was the Ask Dale Jr. segment that Dale Jr. always does every week. And someone had asked, and there's been a lot of questions surrounding Dale Jr.'s future in racing in NASCAR. And he says that the Bristol Xfinity Series race, which is in two weeks from now, could be the last race we see Junior race in NASCAR. He did confirm that he will do, be doing more late model races in the future. He did say he'll probably be racing late models for the next 15 to 20 years. 
But he did confirm that this likely could be his final NASCAR race altogether in the top three series. There's been a lot of chatter about this over the course of the last few weeks. There's been talk about this. Obviously, it kind of started when it was announced back in early August that Connor Zilich will be driving an 88 car full-time for Junior Motorsports next season. Of course, that 88 has been a track house number as well since Shane Van Gisbergen is driving an 88 car in the NASCAR Cup Series. And there began to be a lot of speculation about it. And there's rumors over the course of the last few months. Now, Dale Jr., to be fair, will be 50 at the end of this year. And Dale Jr. has been doing this for a very, very long time. He's been racing in NASCAR some form and capacity since pretty much, I believe, the 1995 or 1996 season when he drove part-time in the NASCAR Xfinity Series. And Dale Jr., like I mentioned, is around 50 years old. Now, that being said, I do think Dale Jr. is going to have a really strong chance and a fantastic opportunity to compete for the win. He's really, really good at Bristol. He's won her multiple times in the NASCAR Xfinity Series and also has won there a couple times in Cup, including the 2004 night race at Bristol when he came back. I think Dale Jr. could honestly win. He was on the verge of winning the race last year, had one of the fastest cars in the event, had his car not caught on fire. I think he goes out and wins that race over his teammate, Justin Allgaier, which again, he got ridden to victory lane, which is really, really exciting to see. Drove up there, he got to be inside the car. But I think it's really unfortunate if this is truly it for Dale Jr. But at the same time, like I mentioned, he's going to be 50 years old next year. So I don't blame him. And at least he's going to be racing at late models because he really enjoys racing late models and he's been doing it for many, many years. So I hope Dale Jr., I would love to see him come back in 2025. Maybe he changed his mind and does come back in 2025. But like I said, it sounds very, very likely at this particular moment and point that Dale Jr.'s last race in the NASCAR Xfinity Series or NASCAR altogether, it sounds like it might be coming in a couple weeks at Bristol. If it truly is, congratulations to Dale Jr. on a very amazing and incredible career in NASCAR Xfinity competition and also in NASCAR altogether as a whole. And of course, he's going to be focused on doing Amazon coverage for the Cup Series and TNT as well. So he's going to have a lot of prior on that and of course owning a team as well and now we're going ahead jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about martin truex jr now Martin truex jr did speak to Amina during playoff media day and he announced something really cool on sirius m nascar radio he has officially confirmed that his crew chief for the daytona 500 which he is expected to run the 2025 daytona 500 his crew chief is going to be cole Perr. on top of that as well the numbers that it sounds like it's coming down to, the numbers that he may end up choosing, is either the number 56 or the number 78. Now, we'll talk about the numbers here in just a second that he could use. Cole Pern has not been involved in racing over the last few years. Now, he did do some IndyCar work with Ed Carpenter Racing, I believe, in the Indy 500 in 2020 or 2021, if I remember correctly. But he has not been in NASCAR since 2019 when he retired from doing that and then of course went up to work in a ski lodge in Canada. These two were a dynamic duo. They won a lot of races. In 2015, they ended up winning one race. Martin Truex Jr. won at Pocono. 2016, Martin Truex Jr. scored four victories at Cole Pern. Unfortunately, though, got eliminated, I believe, in the round of 12. 2017, they had an incredible season with Furniture Racing, where he scored eight victories that year and went on to win the championship. And then, of course, in 2018, while Furniture Row shut down, they still went on to win four races and nearly won the championship that year. And then in 2019, I think they won six or seven races. And then after that, since that time, Mark Truex Jr.'s performance has unfortunately been declining, which is why I think it's really awesome and fantastic to see that Cole Pern is coming out of retirement. I wouldn't be surprised if you just see him being the crew chief for the Daytona 500. I'd have to imagine he'll probably be his crew chief for the Xfinity Series race he runs, which he did confirm he is going to be running the Xfinity race at Rockingham next year, most likely with Joe Gibbs Racing. And the big question is what team? Is he driving for in the Daytona 500? We do think most likely it is going to be 2311 Racing. Now, the number, like I mentioned, it sounds like it's coming down between the 56 and the number 78. If I were a betting man, I'd love to see the 56. That, of course, was a number he had in Michael Waltrip Racing, and it did have a lot of success. But it also probably brings back a lot of bad memories of what happened with the Michael Waltrip Racing fiasco in 2013. But also, that number has been a big number in the Martin Truex family. His father drove the 56 for many years, so I could definitely see him using that number. But the 78... If BJ McLeod and Live Fast, which I don't think BJ is going to care at that point, I think it'd be really cool if they use the 78 car. It would be really great to see that number come back. Maybe find a way to get Five Hour Energy to sponsor for those races or find a way to have Bass Pro and those companies work on March Jr. I think that'd be really, really cool. 
Nonetheless, this is really exciting news to hear. It sounds like we're close to having an announcement in regards to that. Denny did say to the media that they're very close to announcing that in the future. And overall, I think it's really, really exciting stuff and really great to see that it sounds like we're really close to having that happen. And it's pretty awesome. The March Trick Junior most likely is going to be running the Daytona 500 next year, which is exciting. Can we find a way to get other jobbers out of retirement to come out? Maybe like Tony Stern in the future. No, Tony's probably not going to be involved in the future. But I would definitely love to see some other drivers come out of retirement and run this event. It would be very awesome overall, to be honest with you. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Paddle War. Now, we've talked about Paddle War quite a bit on the channel over the course of the last week or so. Over the weekend at the IndyCar race, Paddle War was very, very frustrated about not being allowed to run, bring, or IndyCar not going to Mexico City and NASCAR getting ahead of them on racing in Mexico City, considering the fact that Paddle has been pushing for the last four or five years to go to Mexico City, and they unfortunately failed to get that done. Well, over this week, it was reported by Jenna Fryer from the Associated Press that NASCAR is very interested in acquiring Paddle Ward to race in the NASCAR race at Mexico. And apparently, Paddle Ward also stated this week, and this kind of came out from NASCAR and NBC's Twitter page, that Paddle Ward himself is also interested in racing in NASCAR as well at the Mexico City race. Now, he said it may not happen in 2025 because of the Gateway race, but he could run another series. Now, Zach Brown did speak to the media and spoke to Jenna Fryer as well, and he did confirm that if Paddle War can find a way to secure an Xfinity Series ride, he may be able to run the Xfinity Series race that weekend. Now, Denny Hamlin also did say that there is a chance he can find a way to get him behind the wheel of a 2311 racing car for that event if it was to happen. Obviously, Paddle War has been wanting IndyCar to go to Mexico City for a while. But I've been saying this, Paddle Ward it would be absolutely a massive, massive win for NASCAR if Paddle Ward could come and race in the Mexico City race at the Autodrama Hernando Rodriguez track. Paddle Ward has one of the best personalities on the internet. He's got a major following on Instagram. I think he's got like 700,000 followers on Instagram. He's part of the McLaren family. And he'd also be able to bring a lot of sponsorship and funding as well. I know he mentioned 23 Live and Racing, but I actually think the team that most likely would have him drive is Project 91 and Trackhouse Racing. Considering the fact that, of course, the Chevy fit situation, of course, Aaron McLaren does work with Chevrolet in IndyCar, I think it'd be very interesting for him to go to Project 91. Plus, obviously, we know that Justin Marks is interested in having an IndyCar team in the future as well. But if he doesn't go to the cup race, there are some options in the Xfinity series. Maybe Dale Jr. does feel the ride for him in the Xfinity race. We know that Dale Jr. has fielded drivers like Miguel Paluto in the past. And I think getting a chance to run the Xfinity race would be really, really cool. He gets to race against a lot of great talent next year and go up against guys like Connor Zilch. And he gets to see what potential guys that he could be looking at if he ever decided to switch over to NASCAR. But I would love to see Pat Award get the chance and opportunity to run the Mexico City race. I think he actually would be very, very competitive. And I think he'd be able to get up to speed very, very quickly in a NASCAR Cup or an Xfinity Series car. We've seen a lot of drivers come into the next-gen era and be able to be very, very quick. We've seen drivers, of course, like Shane Van Gisbergen, who now is a full-time Cup ride for 2025. We've seen drivers like Jimmy Johnson come out of retirement to race. Ryan Newman come out of retirement. Greg Biffle come out to retirement. We've seen other drivers had success in the latter stages of their careers. We're going to have Juan Montoya coming in and running at Watkins Glen next weekend. We're going to have other drivers like Kimi Raikkonen. We've had him come and race. We've had Jensen Button come and race. Joey Hand come in and race. And I think it's just so cool to see that the next-gen car has a lot for stuff like this to really, really happen. So overall, this is really exciting stuff for sure, nonetheless, and really exciting that it sounds like we might be getting closer and closer to having Paddle War coming and racing in NASCAR, which would be really exciting overall, to be perfectly honest with you. And now we're going to head jump on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the charter agreement once again. Now, earlier this week on Monday, it was reported by, or Tuesday, excuse me, it was reported by Adam Stern that NASCAR is wanting to have the charter agreement wrapped up by the end of this week, right before the playoffs took place. And according to it, it sounds like the teams have agreed to a revenue split for 2025. But recently, there was an anti-disparagement clause that was added to the new charter agreement, and that's kind of part of that new clause that came in as well. 
It sounds like there are some teams that are still against the charter agreement, according to this, but it also sounds like there are some teams that are absolutely ready to sign it. Now, Denny Hamill did speak to the media once again, like he's been doing through the charter agreement situation, and he says there's still a lot of work that needs to be done with the charter agreement and says we are nowhere close to being done. He did say that to the media this week that he says that he believes that something, they are done with it, but he also has been told by other owners on the phone that they are not close to being done as well. And a very interesting thing that was noted, because Denny Hamlin and his team have been very outspoken, apparently NASCAR did not present them the regular season trophy. Usually every year when the team, the team owner is presented by NASCAR with the regular season trophy. So far through the charter negotiations, there's been really one organization that has been more outspoken than any other team. And that, of course, is 2311 Racing. We saw Curtis Pohl wear that little sign on the back of his shirt during the Southern 500 right before they came out. We obviously, of course, seen Denny Hamill wear the back on the back of his as well. We see Michael Jordan said that if charters don't become permanent, that the sport is going to die overall. Obviously, it's kind of a really complicated situation because I understand where the teams are coming from in a situation, right? The teams, they want permanent charters. They want more revenue. They want to have more sustainability, and they want more growth, which, to be honest, I can't really blame them. The problem for the teams is that you have people like Jim France who are basically running the sport like it's been for many years. Jim France and the France family as a whole has been ruling NASCAR with an iron fist for 76 years. And I feel like that we're in a different time and age. I feel like in the future, that's not going to be able to happen. But as of right now, I think that is going to happen. I think a lot of us are just so frustrated with the charter agreements taking so long. Because at one point, it's like, okay, everyone's going to have to come to the table. Because if both sides don't come to the table, it doesn't affect the teams as much. The teams really don't care. Denny says that they're not in a rush to get it done. We well, probably should be in a rush to get it done. Because we're in the beginning of September. By the time you're watching this, it is September 6th of 2024. Keep this in mind. The charter agreement is only got to be done by the end of this year on December 31st. And really has to be done by the Daytona 500 next year, which is February 16th. We need to get this charter agreement done as soon as possible. The farther we go and the longer it takes for the charter agreement to get done, the more worried I continue to get. Do I think it is going to get done? Yeah, more than likely it's going to get done, but I do think that once one or two teams do sign the charter agreement, I do think all the teams are going to start following. I think that is going to happen eventually where all the teams eventually will follow. Because right now only one team really has to sign the charter agreement, and that's the charter agreement. Now, teams, like it was reported by Adam Sturm, could maybe negotiate and get better terms for themselves, but I feel like everybody wants to have better deals and wants to be on the same playing field right there because not every team owner is the same. And what's kind of being worried about is you have some team owners that are like, yeah, we definitely want to agree to this and we're ready to sign this. Well, you have other team owners, probably like Denny Hamlin, who are kind of against what is going on at the moment. At some point, like I said, though, this charter agreement needs to get done. Steve Alletta said it today. Their 2025 plans are affected right now. They haven't signed an dissension. Bubba Walsh, we don't know if he's coming back. We do expect they'll be back with 20 through 11. But they're waiting to announce their plans for 2025. And I think a big reason for that is because of the charter agreement currently at the moment. Again, I still think more than likely the charter agreement is going to get finalized. And I think it's going to get done. But until then, we'll continue to speculate and we'll continue to wait. Hopefully very, very soon we can have a charter agreement finalized. And hope we can have it done here in the not-so-distant future. And now we're going to go ahead and jump on to the first of two major stories in today's episode as we're talking about RFK Racing. As there was a board by Jordan Bianchi from The Athletic last night that RFK Racing is expected to expand to a three-car operation in 2025. It's expected that Kroger will leave JTG Doherty Racing at the end of the 2024 season. While well, it had been rumored they were going to be going over to Joe Gibbs Racing, they are expected to head over to RFK Racing in 2025. Now, with RFK expected to expand in 2025, who will be the driver of the third car? Could it be Zane Smith? Could it be Harrison Burton? No. The driver that's expected to get behind the wheel of the third RFK Racing car is expected to be Ryan Priest. Ryan Priest is the only Stuart Haas Racing driver currently at the moment that is not signed for 2025 with Stuart Haas Racing shutting down at the end of this year. Noah Grayson, of course, going over to Front Row Motorsports to drive either the 34 or the 36 car next year. 
It's also, we already know that Chase Briscoe is driving the 19 car, placing Mark Jerk Jr., who will retire from full-time racing at the end of this year. will be part-time, including having Cole Pern as a crew chief for the Daytona 500. And Josh Brie will be going to drive the 21 car for the Wood Brothers, replacing Harrison Burton next season. Ryan Priest has had a really good relationship with Kroger in the past. Remember, he drove for JTD Doherty Racing in the NASCAR Cup Series from 2019 to 2021. And keeping those relationships around can really benefit you, considering that Ryan Priest is in stores with his cardboard cutout, among other things. This move would make a lot of sense. Now, the big question is, where are they going to get a third charter? Because according to what Jordan Bianchi did report as well, they're not expected to go unchartered and have an open car because of the cost of having an open charter. So where are they going to get the charter from? Some have speculated they're going to get a charter from Stuart Haas Racing. I don't expect that in all honesty. I think that that third final charter from Stuart Haas Racing's fire sale is probably going to end up going over to 2011 Racing. We do think Riley Hurts most likely is going to end up at 2011 Racing, even though personally I think it should be Corey Heim. But I think Riley Hurts is expected to be behind a wheel of a third 2011 Racing car. The two teams that I could see this from, the first one could be Colleg Racing. Colleg Racing already has announced that A.J. Allmendinger will be driving a 16 car for Colleg Racing in the NASCAR Cup Series next year, but they have not announced who's driving a 31 car in 2025. And it's rumored that Colleg and RCR are expected to merge in a pretty big way called One Walk, if I remember correctly, where I think Colleg and RCR are going to be working a lot closer together. So I don't think that that could happen. We could see the 31 charter go. But most likely where the charter, I think, is going to come from is the number 15 car from Rick Ware Racing. Rick Ware Racing is expected maybe to sell one of those charters or basically just hand it off for a year, potentially, considering that RFK and Rick Ware Racing have a really tight-knit technical alliance. We've seen a performance from Justin Haley this year over Rick Ware Racing really improve and get a lot better. We also know that Justin Haley most likely will be going over to Spire Motorsports next year. So, And they're having rumors about Ryan Priest going over to Rick Ware. So I'd have to imagine a 15 car instead of having multiple drivers like a Haley Deegan if she ever got the opportunity, or like a Ryan Priest, or like a Sheldon Creed or someone else, or Harrison Bird, excuse me, getting him on the wheel there. I think it makes a lot more sense to just have that 15 charter go over to RFK Racing. Now, a lot of people I also saw were being mad about Ryan Priest being the driver and not Zane Smith. Ryan Priest, yes, has struggled in the NASCAR Cup Series the last few years, but I think we need to provide a lot of context. He's been driving with multiple organizations that have not been great. Remember, in 2021, he drove an unchartered number 37 car. Keep this in mind. Ryan Priest had a pretty solid start to the season. I believe he got a top 10 in the Daytona 500 and legit had some pretty good runs with that organization with JTG Doherty Racing. Had a ton of success there. And then the SHR, yes, he wasn't amazing in the 41 car, but he was better in 2023 in the 41 than the previous driver Cole Custer had been. Remember, Cole Custer, of course, went back down to the NASCAR Xfinity Series and won the championship in 2023 and could go back-to-back this year with the speed and pace that he has been showing. But then, of course, I think about this year. Yes, he's been in the worst car, but the 41 car has not been a championship contending or a really great car since Kurt Busch left the team in 2018. Dale Soros struggled in that car. We also saw Cole Custer struggle, and I know Priest struggled, but also you had Chad Johnson, who got fired midway from the year from Chip Ganassi Racing. So I really think it's more just Chad Johnson issue than a Ryan Priest issue. And we all kind of thought the same about Chris Buescher when he went over to RFK Racing. I think if you have someone like him go over there and race... I think that Ryan Priest would do a lot better. I could see him having a Chris Buescher level career where he really turns the corner over at RFK Racing and really sets the world on fire. I think he is a very good race car driver, in my opinion. He's done good when he drove a course for David Gill and racing for the switch over to Tricon when they switched to Toyota, and they had a lot of success. So I think having him be the driver really, really makes a lot of sense. And again, having those relationships with Kroger as a sponsor really works out in his favor. So I think Ryan Priest being the driver behind the wheel would make a lot of sense. This has been rumored, and it's expected to happen very, very soon. According to The Athletic, it sounds like maybe by the end of this month, Brad did state that they're close to announcing it, and it sounds like it's not too far down the road from being officially announced. I want to see this happen. I want to see RFK be able to expand and become a three-car team. The last time they were a three-car team was only back, of course, in 2016. 
when they had Greg Biffle, they had Trevor Bain and Ricky Stenhouse Jr. And then they downsized in 2017 to a two-car team, but they've been getting better. Brad's influence over at RFK Racing, all the accomplishments they've had. They've been able to bring drivers in like Cam Waters and Joey Hand, and it's been really exciting to see. This is probably going to be announced in the future, and it's pretty exciting and great to see, nonetheless, that RFK Racing is going to be expanding, and I think this is a massive and huge deal for NASCAR across the board, as RFK Racing will for sure be expanding in 2025. And now we're going to head on to the final major story of today's episode as we're talking about Alex Bowman once again. Now, a couple days ago on this channel, it was kind of came out during the Door Bumper Clear Podcast and there have been some rumors and chatter about Alex Bowman's future. They had stated that if Alex Bowman did not make it past the round of 16, they said Alex Bowman may be out of a ride at Hendrick Motorsports at the end of this year. And earlier this year, Bob Pockers had initially reported that Alex Bowman, yes, he got that win in Chicago, but if he struggled in the playoffs and really screwed up a lot, he could be out of a ride, in, kind of paraphrasing, he could be out of a ride at the end of this year. Well, during playoff media day yesterday, he confirmed to Alan Kavana and many reporters in the industry that were at the media day, he confirmed that those rumors are not true at all. He said it got to the point where the rumors had become very, very annoying about him leaving the organization or being fired from the organization. And he also said that it got to the point where he actually had to call his bosses. And the bosses of Hendrick basically told him that the rumors and reports are not very true. The rumor that had been going on is that Alex Bowman was going to be booted out of the 48 car for potentially either, let's say, Kyle Busch or Justin Haley, or maybe even Bubba Walls, and he was probably going to end up in the number 7 car for 2025. Now, let's say this. I'm very happy to see Alex Bowman dispel this rumor. Look, Alex Bowman, in my opinion, is a very talented race car driver. Has he been the fourth wheel at Hendrick Motorsports the last few years? Yes, but there's some pretty big excuses for Alex Bowman. I think some pretty defendable excuses. Number one, in 2022, he was probably going to make the round of eight that year. Guess what? He had a concussion after a crash at Texas Motor Speedway. That was a race where a lot of flat tires ended up happening and hit the outside wall to the point where he had a concussion and missed a ton of races till Phoenix. Then in 2023, he was leading the point standings at one point and had a back injury in a sprint car race in the High Limit Series at Lawrenceburg, Kansas, and never was the same after that. And then in 2024 so far, well, he hasn't really been leading a ton of laps. And to be fair, he's only led 14 laps so far in the 2024 season. Alex Bowman has still had 12 top 10s. There are only three drivers that have more top 10s than Alex Bowman this year. Chris Bell, Kyle Larson, and Tyler Reddick, who in my opinion have been the three best drivers in the NASCAR Cup Series so far this year. Again, the last lead total, he's got to work on leading more. But... He got a win this year at the Chicago Street Course. And Alex Bowman has been in the top 10 in points. Hendrick Motorsports is just such a great organization as a whole. You've got Kyle Larson, who is one of the best drivers ever. You have Chase Elliott, who is one of the best drivers ever. And you have William Byron, who is getting to that next level and is probably going to be on the same level as Larson and Elliott in the future. There's always a fourth wheel at Hendrick Motorsports. Now, could this conversation come up once again in the future? Absolutely. I wouldn't be surprised if it does come up again at some point next year. But I think what people need to realize is Alex Bowman, I 100% believe, deserves to be behind the wheel of the 48 car. There's really not a lot of other drivers out there that could do as good as Alex Bowman. I don't think Bubba Walsh gets in the 48 car and does anything as much. I think he'd be good, but he'd probably be on the same level. I think he'd be only a lateral move for Justin Haley, and we do think he's going to 7. I know that they really like him over Hendrick Motorsports, but I think Justin Haley fits a lot better over at Spire, considering he's had a working relationship over there, and Ronnie Chillers and him working together would be really good. And then obviously Kyle Busch rumors continue to spire. I saw something that he was maybe going to go to 23 Live Racing at one point. That happened rumor that had come up in recent weeks. Obviously that did not come true at this point. We do think that Kyle Busch is still expected to be back over at RCR despite it's not been officially announced. Alex Bowman has always been this talk about him. And I just wish that people would kind of stop talking about this to the point. Because again, Door Bumper Clear was not the initial report on this. I've seen multiple people talk about this. Multiple YouTubers have talked about this. And also multiple accounts on Instagram had talked about this as well. But I do believe, like I said, that Alex Bowman 100% deserves behind the wheel of the number 40 A car. He's proven himself this year. He's gotten better. He's shown race winning speed at other races. He could have won Pocono, could have gone back to back. And then we all forget he was in contention in that race and finished second, was leading near the end of that event. 
and at one point was catching. I know he finished third, but he had a chance to win at Pocono. At the end of the day, I do believe Alex Bowman does deserve to be behind the wheel of the 48 car. I hope he's in the 48 car for a long time. Now, obviously, depending on how Roger Kruf does in the future, in like 2026, for example, in trucks, maybe 27, we see him get behind the wheel because Ally, let's be honest here, contracts still can easily be very, very broken. And if Alex Bowman doesn't step up and doesn't get better over the next few years, and he's kind of forming the same as he is, then you might start having conversations. But he's not someone that's going to be a championship-level driver, except in 2021. And there's nothing wrong with that. Not every driver is going to be Kyle Larson. Not every driver is going to be Chase Elliott. Some drivers are going to perform worse, but he's on one of the best organizations. Hendrick Motorsports has the best all-around talent of any organization out there. And I think Bowman is still a really good driver. And if you put him at like Spire Motorsports, for example, he's going to be the number one driver over there. And he's going to be your lead driver. He's going to be the flag driver that you're going to use. Yes, Carson's been great. But I think that Alex Bowman is a better driver overall than Carson Hostovar. So I think Bohm is saying that Hendrick would make a lot more sense, and I'm glad to see that he cleared the rumor up. Now, going by the rest of the silly season, despite there being some speculation rumors about Zane Smith's future, we do think Zane Smith is going to be back, if, is going to be actually still headed over to front row next year. Riley Hurst is still expected to go over to 20 through 11. Same with Bubba Wallace coming back to 20 through 11. Harrison Burton is expected to go to the Xfinity Series. There's been rumors about him going to AM Racing, but that's not been confirmed at this point. Maybe RFK opens up an Xfinity program again, maybe for Harrison to go there. Haley Deegan, haven't heard anything about her at this point or what she's doing at this point. She's probably not going to be back in NASCAR, unfortunately, at this point with all the stuff going on. And then, of course, there's other drivers that could be on the move. Taylor Gray, William Sawal, you name it. And most of the cup rides are set up at this point. Point. I really hope, though, at this point with Alex Bowman, we're kind of done with the rumors about Bowman leaving for a while, and I hope people kind of stop talking about us at this point. I'm glad to see that Bowman cleared up the rumors, basically ended it, said it's bullshit at this point, and just glad to see he dispelled the rumors. Again, contracts can't easily be broken, but Alex Bowman's a great driver, and he 100% deserves to be behind the wheel of a Hendrick Motorsports car. Dale Jr. handpicked him to be behind the wheel of that car, so I think he should be there for many, many years. I'm glad to see that Alex Bowman has dispelled the controversy and the rumors around him on, over the course of the last few weeks. So, that is good for today's NASCAR news and motorsports news video. I want to thank guys for watching. Please subscribe to the channel. Notifications on so if I win a video, it does go live on my channel. Follow me true Facebook and Instagram and support my Patreon as well. Link description below of that and comment your thoughts below on today's episode. Are you happy Alex Bowman is staying with Hendrick next year? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. And what are your thoughts about RFK Racing expanding to a three-car operation in 2025? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I may have a small silly season update video dropping. If not, this news video will be the only one that's dropping tomorrow today, unless, of course, there's some big news that breaks. Tomorrow, we're going to have the Xfinity Series race review. We're also going to have reactions to Cup qualifying as well for Atlanta. And we're also, of course, going to have the Shane Van Gisbergen video dropping. Then, of course, on Sunday, we'll have the Cup review. We'll also have a starting lineup and potentially a Shane Van Gisbergen video, considering he's also doing double duty this weekend. Got a lot of great content dropping over the course of the weekend that I cannot wait for you guys to check out. So anyways, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's episode, and I'll see you guys next time for more great, awesome NASCAR content and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, everybody.